by way of introduction, I'd like to start with, uh, with an anecdote, uh, which I hope will reveal a little bit about uh, my own experience with disruptive technologies uh, and how technology can repeatedly deliver these black swan moments where unconventional thinking together with purposeful technology uh, can have a real impact that in, kind of retrospectively all seems very obvious as, as all good technology should. Uh, so this is me, uh, it's not really, <laughs> it's more of an, an archetype of me uh, when I worked in, uh, in the hospital and a couple of, of physicians and myself were able to convince our university to put um, computers on the ward floors. And, and I think that at the time, uh, if you can kind of hark back to the, the old days, or maybe you, you've seen this on um, uh, an ER or whatever the, the, the television shows are, you used to go from room to room with your call books. You kind of used to carry these around from place to place uh, and, uh, and prepare for um, uh, your morning rounds with your attending physician. Uh, and uh, as I said, we, we convinced our university to, to allow us to put these on. Uh, we used some very basic technology uh, at the time. At the time, it was very cutting edge. Uh, the idea was very cutting edge as well, kind of the way that um, uh, AI is considered cutting edge uh, at the moment. But what we're looking to do is provide uh, a way for, for physicians to retrieve information that was otherwise locked in, uh, in books. We created a company from, from this initiative, uh, and, and today it's, it's complete commonplace. Uh, you have physicians who use computers, um, and, 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 and kind of the point of, of this was, was beginning to, to, to put structured information uh, out to be consumed by physicians. Uh, but structuring information uh, is not nearly enough. Uh, and in, 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 in the reason it's not enough is, is that biological science is, is very complex. Uh, it's a big data problem, but it's also a complex data problem. And we can think of, of big data, like Facebook is, is big data. They've got, they've got a, a million, bazillion uh, users uh, that are all connected uh, in, in some way. But the entity type is more or less all the same. It's a person. Uh, and the relation that connects them is more or less all the same. It's nose. So this person is this person is this person. Uh, but in biology, there's any number of different entity types. There's genes, there's proteins, there's diseases, there's cures, there's patients. And the things that relate these together is, is, is even more complex. It could be that this, this gene upregulates this process or downregulates or phosphorylates or is a cure. So it's incredibly complex. Uh, and, and, and this knowledge, or, or rather an exceedingly small proportion of that knowledge, drives scientific innovation. It drives what our blue sky scientists uh, are coming up with. And, and kind of the, 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 the traditional method of, of blue sky scientists, because I, I think uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, I, um, uh, I started a, a biotech so, some time ago, so I, I kind of know how this, uh, this, this process works. Uh, and, and that small sliver of information, so the average scientist will read somewhere between 200 to 400 papers uh, a year, and they read consumptively. That's a lot of papers to read a year. And they read something, they put it in the back of the mind, they read something, they put it in the back of the mind, they read something else. And if they're lucky enough to have that eureka moment where, they're, where they've kind of connected that dot, uh, and found a, a new cure for, for a disease uh, than, than happy days. But this is, this is an exceedingly rare event in, in science. And if it wasn't, we kind of wouldn't have any disease left to cure. But uh, alas, it is, it is a very, very difficult and rare event. Uh, but now we're able to use technology instead to augment the scientific, uh, the scientist's intelligence, I guess, in, in a way. Uh, we're trying to make our really smart blue sky scientists even smarter. I, I, talked, I talked earlier about how computers in the hospital uh, are now the norm. Uh, and I, I guess the, the, the reason for that anecdote is because for patients and, and doctors of the future, AI will be the norm. And, and if you look at, 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 at patients themselves, uh, or their families, they, they are amongst the most well-read. They have a deep-seated, vested interest uh, in, in understanding their disease, understanding everything that's currently known uh, and everything that was previously known to, to, to help in, inform them. 
Uh, and where companies like WebMD democratize human health information for uh, originally for physicians to consume, and now obviously we, we all can consume that information, uh, AI is democratizing human health understanding. And there's a big distinction between presenting information and actually presenting the understanding of what that information means. And, and I think that the, the ability to hold vast amounts of, of information and grasp meaning in context, uh, I feel, is where, where technology is, is bringing us. We can look very closely at the underlying mechanisms and causes uh, of disease without having to be a medical specialist. AI helps us to be scientific experts uh, without the need to deeply understand that domain. Uh, and I think in, in healthcare, AI is is the new black. You know, over the next five years or so, we're going to see more change in healthcare than the previous fifty. Uh, and much of that change is going to come from technology, and much of that technology is going to be artificial intelligence. And those early days uh, working in the hospital, trying to find uh, a, uh, a a better way to retrieve information to give a differential diagnosis has kind of led me uh, to a technology investor, to founding a biotech, and kind of all the way full circle back into a tech. Well, this one's kind of more of a, a tech bio uh, hybrid, and and I believe that um, it's 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 trying to answer perhaps one of the the greatest opportunities that exist in in, in any industry, and, and that's the effective understanding of information. What, what does all this mean, if you can put it all together? Every discussion about the power of technology and the changes that, it, that it's going to bring um, uh, begins with data. Data is the world's new natural resource. Uh, or more accurately, um, because we have so much information, uh, we've, we've kind of reached a bottleneck where um, our ability to generate information uh, is, is hampered by our ability to, to consume that information uh, and, and try to make sense of what that is. And just kind of put it in perspective, um, there are, there are 10,000 new updates to PubMed every night, 10,000 new publications. So kind of by the time I finish this, there'll be another 200 publications. Uh, that uh, uh, that are going to be be, pu be published. And as I said before, an average scientist will read between 200 and 400 of those papers uh, every year. So this is a real problem in, in the age of scientific ex discovery. It means that the patients are not getting the treatments uh, as fast as they otherwise should. Uh, in short, uh, despite living uh, in a knowledge age, we are not getting uh, smart fast enough. But, but what if, what if that those, those, the scientists could read all 10,000 of those publications uh, that were published every night? And what, what more, what if they could read the 25 million publications that happened before them? Uh, what if they could, they could read and understand all the chemistry databases, the genomic databases, the proteomic databases? What if they could read the 90 million patents that exemplify innovation? And what's more, what if they had digital recollection of what all that was? And if they could reason on top of that, imagine the sheer scale of in innovation and the, the, the impact uh, that it could, uh, it could have on society. And I believe truly that we'll only know in the future what we know with the help of machines. There's just too much information for us otherwise uh, to, to digest. Uh, and well, I, I think that there's there's been a lot published on on artificial intelligence, and I think that we can safely say uh, whether you're a, a pundit or, or a critic uh, or an advocate, uh, they can all agree on on two things: one, it's going to be big, uh, and and two, it's going to be everywhere. And I think if you look at recent publications in terms of of the number of industries that it that it's going to impact, it's some 29 industries. Uh, and revenue generated from, from artificial intelligence will be in the trillions by, by 2025. And I think that healthcare will see perhaps the highest rate of adoption because it, it has such a data bottleneck. Uh, and it probably will see the greatest impact uh, from this technology uh, to, to any other industry that's out there. Uh, and while AI has this broad application, uh, disrupting this industry is probably the one that's, that 
that's that's going to have the real power. At the moment, we have thirteen thousand eight hundred and forty-seven diseases. Okay, those are those those are machine learning uh, diseases, of which five thousand of them are treated. Okay, so that means that there are eight thousand diseases that have no treatment whatsoever, and that's the real opportunity. It's it's understanding the underlying cause of a disease, and you can take a drug through. The drug development process, you know, you have a 97% uh, attrition rate. And even in late stage clinical development, even in, in phase three, after you've kind of spent hundreds of millions getting to that point in time, you still have a 50% failure rate because it was the wrong biology. You can have the best chemical, the safest chemical in the world, but if it actually doesn't work, you don't have a drug. And that's the real opportunity uh, that, that we see today. Uh, I, I'm, I'm conscious that I've spent you know, quite a bit of this, this, this talk so far, talking about artificial intelligence without really explaining uh, what I mean by that. And, and, and for, for benevolent, uh, that's, that's a narrow artificial intelligence. We're not, we're not looking at generalized uh, intelligence. Uh, we're not trying to supplant human intelligence. We're trying to, to augment that. And I think that that's, that's a big difference. Uh, we, we ingest a tremendous amount of, uh, of information, kind of the world's compendium, uh, but, but some of it is, 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 is knowing what you should know based on what you do know. And I, I sometimes think of it like the periodic table of, of elements from yesteryear, kind of the thing that, that you may have learned uh, back in the early days of, um, of grade school for us it would have been high school, uh, where, uh, where there are big pieces of that table that were missing, but you knew attributes of what those elements were. So you kind of know roughly where it sits in the periodic table. So you know if it's a gas or a metal. You know what, what row it's in, so you know how many valence electrons it has. You know what its atomic number is. Uh, so you can begin to, 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 to infer the type of things that you should know on a disease based on what you do know. And that, that, that should be known piece of it is what we will look at as a drug target to treat something which is otherwise untreatable. Um, so that kind of brings us to, to, to the big question uh, here, uh, and, and I, I guess I'll, I'll give a bit of, of, of background of, of some of the things that, that we've done within our, our own company. Uh, so one of our first programs that, that we worked on was, was an ALS. It, it's the disease that uh, Stephen Hawkins uh, recently passed away from. And it's an incredibly complex disease. Uh, there are 20 genes associated with, with ALS. Um, and as a patient, you, you can have one of those gene mutations, you can have four of those gene mutations, you can have 20 of those gene mutations. Uh, but 85% of those patients don't have any of those disease mutations. So what's going on in this disease? And this is a perfect machine learning artificial intelligence problem. It's, it's, it's trying to link what the molecular signature of that disease is. In, in about five hours time, uh, our system generated um, five hypotheses uh, to, uh, to, to treat the disease. Um, we took it up to, uh, to Sheffield uh, for the, um, uh, the Institute of Translational Medicine there. It's a, it's a um, uh, center of excellence for, for ALS. It took a while for those to, uh, uh, for, the, for the studies to, to be published and, and come back to us. But what it showed is that in that, those five hours, hypothesis was generated uh, to, uh, to treat this disease where, where nothing, has been, nothing has been useful in treating that disease uh, in the past. Uh, and um, uh, it's a huge inventive step for, for patients, and we've been able to repeat that. I think now we, we're, we have 20 programs uh, in our pipeline which are looking at very, very complex diseases uh, that we have. So I'm, I'm gonna summarize here because I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I, I'm, I'm running out of time. But you know, I, I sometimes think, uh, so the answer is yes. Um, uh, and I sometimes think of um, uh, the, kind of this, the, the, this quote, looking at uh, the industrial age where, where you have um, uh, we had the steam engine, which infinitely multiplied uh, the power of our muscles. And I think that we're now at a stage where AI is, is, is infinitely multiplying the, the power of, of our brains.